Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our... Welcome to this April's drive-in service. You know, it's been uh, five or six weeks now since we've been able to meet in the church, but this is still a hundred times better than me in the sanctuary uh, looking out at only Bernie. But it feels like I'm looking only at Bernie again. It's hard to see y'all behind the windshields, but I know you're here. And welcome everybody on Facebook. Glad that you are here as well. Uh, as you might know, as we are missing one important team member this morning, Diane is not here. And so this morning's music is going to be, we have it recorded on, a, uh, on my computer. And so I'll have to go and press play and all that. So a little different. And also, when we do these hymns, uh, these are pretty classic hymns of the faith. But I think most of us are used to the way Diane or Nicole or Susan plays them. So the tempo might be just a little different, but you can hopefully uh, adjust to that. Well, our first hymn this morning uh, is How Great Thou Art, which is number four in your hymnals. And it's also our church's favorite hymn. About eight years ago, we did a poll to find out what our favorite hymns were, and this came out as number one, so hopefully you all know it. If you don't have your hymnals, it's in your insert, and if you are online watching, uh, the post right before this one, I put on um, the bulletin and all the worship materials so you can find it there as well. So our first hymn is How Great Thou Art. Hear that music? Sings my soul, 
my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and then proclaim, my God, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee, are struggling with a little wind here. Please join me for our opening prayer. Great are you, O Lord, and marvelous are your works, and there is no word which is sufficient to sing of your wonders. For you of your own good will have brought into being all things which before did not exist and by your might you uphold creation, and by your providence you order the world. Amen. We're going to sing the Gloria a cappella today. Glory be to the Father. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Well, not much in the way of announcements. I'll just remind you that uh, Memorial Day weekend pie sale and VBS have been canceled and my sabbatical has been pushed back from this summer to next summer. Uh, the newsletter is going to be going out next week. So if you have anything for the newsletter, email or call Luann. She'll be getting that done this week. Thank you for those who have been continuing to give. Uh, we're going to be going around in a little bit with the fish nets again. And thank you. If you're online, you're welcome to send a check to the church or go to our website, somersetchurch.com, and there is a giving tab on the home page. Uh, small groups continue to meet, and I know you probably got some extra time on your hands. I would encourage you to join one of the small groups. We're doing it online, so if you uh, would like to join one of those groups, just let me know and I can make, you, make that happen. Uh, so that's really all in the as way of announcements. We'll continue to do the drive-in services each Sunday, as we mentioned before, and also online as we continue as well. Our responsive reading. You have your hymnals at 645. It's on missions. It's also in the insert. So I'm going to read the light print. I'm also going to read the bold print, too, with you. I, I didn't like the way Brad does it. I'm going to do it as well, because I, I figured those of you online, it's hard to... You can't hear anyone else if you, you're just hearing the half of it. So, 645, missions. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Say not ye that there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest? 
Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Our second hymn is He Leadeth Me. Now, when we were getting this ready, uh, our hymn, our hymnal has three verses. When I played this recording, it had four verses. And I thought to myself, well, that's strange. So I went online and lo and behold, there are four verses to this hymn. So the hymnals only have three. Your inserts have all four. So if you want to follow the music in the hymnal, that's fine. Just know that verse 2 in the hymnal is now verse 3, and verse 3 is now verse 4. And you'll need to look at your insert for verse 2. Everyone got that? Oh, what, one person got it. All right, good. So I'm going to switch with Brad, and we'll get the music going. He leadeth me.
start and pray again. <laughs> That's good. Hey, as we go to prayer this morning, um, we certainly have a lot to be praying for. Uh, I think specifically of the uh, nursing homes. There, as this uh, COVID-19 goes around, we know that's the most dangerous place for it to be. Um, we think of over in Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Living Center. That is where uh, Kim Jones's parents live. It's also where uh, Glenn's friend Georgia lives as well. And we want to pray for that facility as it's, uh, as it's uh, found its way there. And also Spring Arbor, the, the assisted living there that uh, Susan Stubbins works at there. It also, they have some cases found as well. Um, and we also think of Summit Park Nursing Home. As far as I know, uh, that's what Joyce Foster is. And nothing is, everything's even good there as far as I know. But we want to pray for them as well. Um, and we'll certainly continue to pray for Jim and Joyce Bailey. Uh, Joyce came home last weekend or last month, Sunday or Monday. And she is in hospice care right now. I was able to see her this week. Um, it really wasn't the doctor's decision. It was hers. She just, she was, she's tired. She's tired. And so she is at peace and she is, um, I, I would say, a good heart and mind as, as she prepares to uh, go to her eternal home. And so let's be, we should be praying for her and especially Jim as well. Uh, they're such a big part of this church for a long time. I was talking with them this, when I was talking with them, I, was, I reminded them that the three of us all became members here of this church together the same Sunday back when Dr. Reese was here, probably like 2003 or two or something like that. So um, anyway, they need our prayers, obviously, this morning. So we'll be praying for them. Um, I had a prayer request come in that we need to be praying for our small businesses uh, there will be, you know, as you guys know, at least here in Michigan, some of them will be starting to open here on Monday, uh, a few of them, and across the nation, that's the case for some states as well. We pray for those business owners who are trying to keep their businesses alive, but also be uh, safe and smart and all that, and so they need our prayer requests. And I know within our church, I always think of Alex and uh, Terry Taylor, who both have uh, who are both small business owners themselves, so we want to be thinking of them and praying for them as well. Um, and we want to continue to pray for Alex and Jennifer Azer, our Health and Human Resources, uh, Human Services, excuse me, secretary, who um, she is the daughter of our former pastor, Dr. Reese, and he is uh, son-in-law. And uh, if you haven't read about him this week or heard about him, it's been a, he's had a rough week. And so they need our prayers, especially. So, and then also let me encourage you. I know it's hard. I can't hear your prayer requests now. And if you're online, I can't either. But if you email me or if you leave a comment, I do go through and I, I make sure to gather those all up and pray for them throughout the week and also to share them this Sunday as well. And thank you for many of you who've been praying for my grandma. She had hip surgery a week ago this morning. Uh, she is in a recovery. In fact, she is up in my home, old hometown of Rogers City in uh, rehab there. And so I want to continue to pray for her. Uh, you can call her Lucas's grandma, uh, Little G or uh, Dottie. That's actually her name. So, And uh, it's good to have my parents here and my aunt and uncle here, here as well. And so God bless you guys. They both have made a couple trips up to wave to my grandma in, in the window. Think of that. You have to go five hours north to go wave through a window, but that's, that's how much they love grandma. So that's a good thing. I've been talking too much to you. How about we talk to the Lord together, all right? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, there's a lot in our hearts and minds this morning as we continue to uh, live this new normal right now with this coronavirus. Father, I pray that when our spirits get strained, when we start to be overwhelmed with worry and anxiety, that we would have our thoughts turned to you, that we would remember that you are in control. None of this surprises you. In fact, in one essence, we can say this is your hand. This is your will. We know it's not your will ever for us to suffer, but do you have a permissive will that allows these things to happen? And Father, we don't know why right now, but we know that you can take even these this situation that we're going through and bring glory, glory, glorious things out of it. We pray that you would do that. We're thankful for all the families who are reconnecting because of this. We thank you for all the all of us who've taken have to 
kind of slow down a little bit and to um, have more time to think and reflect and pray and read. We pray that your gospel will continue to thrive during this uh, time and that places where it hasn't reached, it would reach uh, new ears and new, and new ways, Father. Father, I certainly want to lift up to you these nursing homes in Brooklyn and Spring Arbor and Jackson, and I think of the one where my grandma's up at Rogers City. We pray, Father, that they would not be ravaged by this virus. We pray that um, they would, that the ones that do have it right now, those residents would be quarantined, that they would recover, and it wouldn't spread any further. Father, we think of those who are working on our behalf, especially those in the healthcare uh, fields. We pray for those within our church. We think of like Donovan and Tiffany, Savannah and Tina, Tony and Susan, David, Amanda, Jesse, Tim and Matt. And we, as we thank you for folks within our circle as well, our families. Uh, we think of Jeannie and Doug and uh, John. And we also want to pray a special request come in for uh, a friend, uh, Renee, that he has got the virus and he is in, uh, not doing well. So we pray for his recovery today. Father, we think of the Salvation Army of Hillsdale. We uh, thank you that they're continuing to serve even though they had to they have to be creative about it as well, but that they're able to get food into uh, the hands of those who need it here in our county. And so we pray that you continue to encourage them and keep their workers and volunteers safe that they might continue to serve. Father, we pray for our small business leaders and owners who are trying to keep their businesses alive in, during this very difficult time. Uh, we pray especially for Terry and Alex to watch over them, and we pray that you would give them the uh, wisdom and discernment they need to move forward during this uncertain time. We pray also for our president and for the coronavirus task force. We pray for the governors. We also want to lift up to you Health and Human uh, Services Secretary Alex Azer and his wife Jennifer. Father, we pray for them. They need our prayers. They need wisdom. They don't need to. Certainly, we all have our criticisms of, 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 of someone because it's hard not to criticize during this time and always thinking that there's a better way to do it. But, Father, they need our prayers for just... Uh, wisdom and make be able to make the right decisions uh, so we pray for them father we just pray for a breakthrough we pray for the researchers who are putting together vac trying to put together vaccines and treatments even now father that you would give them a breakthrough that um, would help speedily end this crisis father we continue to pray for Sarah and Hunter and Anne and the rest of their family as they continue to uh, as they continue in this season of grief with the passing of Luke, we pray for Beverly, for her safety. Would you watch over her? And we also lift up to you, Jim and Joyce Bailey. Father, we are so thankful that she knows you and that she is ready to spend eternity with you. We pray especially for Jim as he is with Joyce during these final days and weeks, however long it is. I pray this would be a sweet time together as they have many, they can share many memories and remembrances together. And we pray for Joyce that uh, she would not be feeling and suffering through as much pain as she was when she was getting the treatments. And so we lift them both into your care. Father, we continue our worship this morning. We pray, I pray that you would help strengthen me as I pray, as I uh, pre prepare to preach your word that your spirit would strengthen my words and open our hearts and ears to hear your message for us today. Father, we thank you. We love you. We've, we appreciate the fact that we've been able to do this for three Sundays in a row without rain, and we thank you for the weather we have this morning, even even the, uh, the little wind that we do have that's kind of giving us some fun. And we thank you for the birds. It's so great to hear the birds, too. Oh, there's so much to be thankful for, and I pray that you would help us to have that heart attitude during this time. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our Parkers are going to go th around with their fishing nets to take up the offering. And while they do, we'll have a song play uh, for you to enjoy. <laughs>
But Father, we thank you so much for how you continue to uphold us and keep us by your providence. We thank you for the opportunity we have to give a portion of it back to you. To show you first that we trust you for all things. And we ask that you would help us to use these this giving to glorify your name and to fulfill the mission you've given to us to share the wonderful news of Jesus Christ with our friends, our family, our neighbors, and even to those in other parts of the world as we support our missionaries like Ned and Marlene McGrady. And for this, we give you thanks, and we pray this morning as your son taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Once again, we'll do the doxology a cappella again, or as well. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. This morning's scripture comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 through chapter 6, verse 1. And you can find it in your insert. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling, reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on, behalf, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. Christian, you are an ambassador, a priest, a witness, and God's co-worker. Last week, we examined Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, that says this, that we are God's handiwork. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And we talked about how discovering your spiritual gifts, your heart, your abilities, your personality, and your experiences, that can guide us into thinking and figuring out where we can serve God best. And we saw that there are many ways to serve God. Today, though, we're going to examine one way in particular that we are called to serve God. One way that Jesus himself gave extra emphasis to. In fact, I don't know how he could have emphasized it more than he did. It was literally his final words, his last will and testament to his disciples. And it's how each of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, ends their Gospels with this command, which in church history has been referred to as the Great Commission. Let me share with you, uh, this comes from actually each of the four Gospels, the end of each of them, and the beginning of, of Acts. Matthew 28, 19. Jesus said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, 
and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Mark 6, 15, Jesus said to them, Go into the, all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Luke 24, 47, Jesus said with, uh, with my authority, Take this message of repentance to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem, this, there is forgiveness of sins for all who turn to me. You are witnesses of all these things. The end of John 20, 21. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And then also in Acts 1, 8, Jesus, right before he ascends to heaven, last words, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus has called us to share the good news of the gospel with others, with our neighbors, our family, our friends, whomever God brings into our lives. We are called to share with them the wonderful news of the gift of salvation and eternal life that can be freely ours through God's grace and mercy. It's not something you have to do, you have to work for, you have to assuage God, you got to beg God for, but it's received simply through faith and repentance. This is Jesus' great commission to us, his followers. Now, unfortunately, I think most of us treat the great commission as more, more like the great suggestion, something that is optional. We fail to realize, again, these are literally Jesus' last words to his disciples and to us. Most of us would rather do just about anything else than this. And here's why. Here's what I think is stopping us. Three things that will be the heart of the sermon today. Our beliefs, our faith, and our fears. I think it's our beliefs, our faith, and our fears that keep us from really wanting, desiring to share our the good news of the gospel. So let's start with our beliefs. Well, there are many false beliefs that if we hold them are going to undermine our desire to share the good news. Let me give you four false beliefs. First false belief, that there is no hell and therefore there's no need. Everyone will just get to heaven at some point. Now, if this is true, why doesn't Jesus emphasize this in his teachings? Instead, there is a relentless focus on the last judgment by Jesus, saying things like, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both the soul and body in hell. Sayings like that from Jesus' lips come up again and again in the Gospels. In fact, Jesus speaks more about hell than anyone else in the Bible. And additionally, if there were is no hell, why do Jesus and the authors of the New Testament emphasize, urge, and plead with Christians to share their faith so much if in the end we all go to heaven anyway? A second false belief, and that is that all religions are basically the same, basically equal, Whatever works for you, works for you. And therefore, who am I to share my faith and try to convince you that I believe the one true faith? Now remember, I should say this is a very arrogant, arrogant thing to say, that all religions are basically the same. It belittles the beliefs of not just the billion Christians on this earth, but also the billions and billions of other folks who follow Buddhism and Hinduism and Islam they would think this is an arrogant thing to say as well. So let's look at those four major religions quickly and their specific truth claims that they hold. Hinduism believes that God is one with creation and takes on millions of forms. Buddhism believes that God may or may not even exist. Islam believes that God is one and absolute and of course we Christians believe God is one but exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, common sense should tell us that these religions do not worship the same being. 
and that all of these truth claims cannot be true at the same time. All religions are not basically equal. They are not all different paths to the same God. What we've done is we've mixed up our right to individual belief with believing each individual belief is right. It's true for them. But contradictory truth claims cannot all be right. It's not like we have different realities. While we certainly ought to be tolerant of others' beliefs, that doesn't mean that we should think that they are all true either. So that's a second false belief, that all religions are basically the same. Here's a third one. Religion is, or should be, just a private individual matter. It's a private individual matter. Religion is fine in private, but you really shouldn't bring it up in public, on the internet, hello, or around the dinner table. There's a current cultural belief that religion ought to be private, but it's not a biblical one. Jesus certainly didn't keep his faith to himself. He didn't teach us that either, to view it as an individualistic, private matter between us and God only. As Christians, our faith is to inform and influence every part of our life. And as Christians, Jesus has called us to go and share our faith very explicitly. So that's a third false belief, that religion is a private, individual matter. Let me give you one more, a fourth false belief. And that is, ah, that's the pastor's job. That's eh, the missionary's job. As long as I support them, I'm doing my part. Yes, keep supporting us. That's a good thing. But you're called to do work as well. Jesus' command to go and share our faith is given to all Christians, not just for pastors and missionaries. Uh, in fact, you probably have a very different way of sharing the faith than I would, and probably in a way that other people could hear, perhaps better than I could even share. Um, here's another way to look at this as well. We are all called to be missionaries. In fact, the Bible even calls us as priests in God's word. So did you know that? You are a priest if you are a Christian. In fact, listen to this. 1 Peter 2, 5 and verse 9 says, You are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Now in the Old Testament, priests were a select group of Israelites tasked with mediating the knowledge, presence, and forgiveness of God to others. That's what, that's what, what their job was. But this passage in 1 Peter tells us Christ has come and he has fulfilled those priestly roles through his life, death, and resurrection. Therefore, Christians are not dependent upon priests or pastors to interpret scriptures for them or to affect God's blessings for them. You can read the scriptures on your own. You can do that. You don't need me to tell you how to, how to read it. Now, I'm going to do my best to help, help you along, but you can actually sit down and read the Bible and understand it. Instead, Christians, you are now a priest bringing God's knowledge and presence and message of forgiveness to those in your world who have not yet begun a relationship with Christ, who do not follow Jesus. As a Christian, you are a priest in service to the Lord. So if we hold any of these false beliefs, that there is no hell, all religions are the same, religion is a private matter, that's the pastor's job, those false beliefs are going to sap any and all excitement sense of duty or purpose to go and share your faith. But besides false beliefs, I think our faith can also undermine our evangelism. For some, they think you have to have a super faith. You have to have it all together, be a super Christian. You have to be really holy to sincerely talk with others about Jesus. We feel like we have to be someone other than who we really are to tell people about our faith. But, as uh, former pastor Charles Spurgeon about 100 years ago put it, I think he puts it rightly, evangelism is simply one beggar telling another beggar 
where the bread is. Now, if we wait until we got it all together, it's going to be too late because that's when we'll be in heaven. What's more, the fact that you are not perfect may even help you share your faith. People can relate to your struggles. It shows you are, you are genuinely authentic. And that's not being a hypocrite, all right? A real hypocrite denies that they have sin, denies that they have struggles. Now, for some, it's not that they are, uh, it's not that they aren't perfect. That's not the problem, all right? For some, it's that their faith has been on the shelf for a while, gotten kind of dusty. It's not much of a faith at all. Or there is some habitual sin in your life that is just sapping all spiritual energy and is sapping your faith. And therefore, when your faith is sapped, your spiritual energy is sapped, you're not going to desire to share God's wonderful news with others. Now, if that's you today, God is calling you to repent and trust in him, to make him the center, the priority of your life again. If your gas tank's on empty, what do you do? You go and fill it up. That's what God wants to do with you. If any of you feel like your spiritual tanks are empty, it's not about you trying hard to fill it up. It's by going to God, seeking him, repenting, and he will fill you up. Our beliefs and our faith certainly are two contributing factors to our lack of evangelistic zeal, but far and away, probably the biggest stumbling block we face is our fears. Our fears. We think evangelism is standing on a soapbox yelling, you are going to hell. When we think of evangelism, you probably think of Mormons going two by two on their bikes with their white shirts and black pants, knocking on doors, and you hiding, peeking through the curtain to see if they've gone away yet, all right? When you think of evangelism, you probably think about, oh, I gotta have a special technique or it's gotta have a slick sales pitch. When you think of evangelism, you probably think, oh, I gotta have all the right answers, I gotta be able to answer all the tough questions that are gonna come my way. When you think of evangelism, you think about, oh, I gotta push it in someone's face, I gotta shove it down their throat, to I gotta, I gotta get a conversion on the spot, and if that's what you think, I wouldn't want to do any of that either. All right? Is that what Jesus did? Does any of that sound like Jesus? No. How did Jesus understand evangelism? Again, his last words to us before he ascended in Acts chapter one verse eight were these. He said, "You will be my witnesses." You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Christian, you are a witness for God. Jesus equates evangelism with being a witness. Now, what's the job of a witness? It is simply to tell what they know, to tell what they've seen and experienced. They don't argue the case. They don't press the verdict. That's Brad's job. That's the lawyer's job, all right? We're going to be witnesses. We're not going to be Brad. Don't be Brad. Be a witness. What does a witness do? They share their testimony. We share what God has done for all of us. We share the good news of Jesus, his life and death and resurrection. We share the gospel, that we are so bad that Jesus had to die for us, but we're also at the same time so loved that Jesus was glad to die for us. So we share what God has done for all of us, but we also share what God has done for each of us. What is your personal faith story? What was your life like before you became a Christian? How did you become a Christian? What's your life like since you became a Christian? Now, it's been wonderful before this crisis hit to be doing a monthly testimony where someone would get up and share about um, what God has done in their life, how they became a Christian, and I guarantee you, this was that was supposed to be this Sunday with a message like this. I was going to have someone do it, and we'll get back to that once we're safe to do so. But think about your own personal witness. How has God? It's it's it. Basically, everyone's got a testimony. If you're a Christian, it's before 
Christ and after? Before Christ and after. What happened to your life before Christ? What was it like? How did you end up coming to Christ? And what's your life like since then? And it could be 30 seconds. It could be uh, three minutes. Who knows whatever your testimony is. We all have one. Everybody's got one. 1 Peter 3.15 puts it like this. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but to do this with gentleness and respect. Who knows, perhaps God has placed you where you are with your unique testimony that is yours alone to be able to reach someone that nobody else could reach. Our fear really comes from the idea that God expects us to do a high-pressured sales pitch and expect results on the spot, which we know is going to turn off our family and friends. Or that we have to have all the right words, we've got to have all the right answers, but God, but Jesus, but the Bible does not instruct us in that way. Instead, we are to meet people where they are and help them move one step closer to God. If you help someone move just one step closer to God, that is a good, wonderful, important thing. And this can be done, of course, through acts of love and kindness, but also through conversations, having the guts to bring it up and talk about it. Hey, how was your weekend? I had a great weekend. You know what? I actually went to church on Sunday. Man, my pastor, what a guy. Let me tell you what he preached about. It was wonderful. And he had this great message on blank. Oh, well, wasn't expecting that. And there you start a conversation, all right? And it's not your words. It's that pastor's words, okay? We are to be witnesses for God. As we come to the end of the sermon, I want to give you some resources. I want to give you some resources that you can use to help you, to help vitalize your desire to share the wonderful news of Jesus. Okay. So let me give you three resources. First resource is your God. Your God is a resource. It's, it's important to know that God is already at work in people's lives, drawing them to himself. That is what God is all about. That's what the whole Bible is all about, saving us and rescuing us. He sends his spirit, the Holy Spirit, uh, to draw people to himself, to show people their need for him, to show people their insufficiencies, to show them what God has done, the greatness of God's love for them. And so when you talk to someone, and, you, and it begins to come to spiritual matters, you begin to bring up the things about God and truths about uh, the Bible and your own personal testimony. Guess what God is doing at that same time that you're speaking? The Holy Spirit is working in that person's heart saying, yes! What he's saying is true. Yes, that is who God is. Yes, this is what God has done for you. We got a guy on the inside, as it were. A second resource that you have is your church. Your church is a resource. We're here to equip and prepare you. And so if you feel like, man, I can't answer any questions, man, I don't have any idea how to share my faith, that is what we're here for, to help get you ready to do those sort of things. And coming to church, come, going online to our Bible studies, that also is a good thing because it gets your heart, it saturates your heart in God's word and in God's presence. And it, in a sense, fills up your spiritual tank. Also, your church is a resource for you in this way as well. It's a place that you can actually bring those who do not know Christ to come and be around other Christians six feet apart right now and also to hear the news about Jesus, to hear these truths from the Bible. So invite them to church. Invite them to Bible studies. That is a perfect resource for you. One last resource. Your calling. Your calling. That's what we've been kind of talking about today. From our passage, which in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we read this today. God gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us that message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal 
through us. That's exactly what he's doing. Friends, you have a very high calling. Christians, you are an ambassador for Christ. He has given you the authority to speak on his behalf, to share his will and desire with others. And what is his will and desire? Is this a very difficult message? Is it a message of doom and gloom and despair? No, it's just the opposite. We've been given the message of reconciliation. That through Jesus, anyone and everyone can be reconciled with their creator and heavenly father. And can experience new life in him. That's a great message to give. Basically, you can help people discover the meaning of life. Yes, there will be social risks. Yes, there might be costs involved. But nothing is as satisfying, as exciting, as seeing God transform someone's life and know that you had a small part to play in it. The eternal consequence of helping even just one person become a Christian are staggering. Friends, as we think about all of this in the context of our personal identity, who we are in Christ, we see that our lives have great meaning and dignity. We are told in 2 Corinthians 6, 1, that we are God's fellow workers. Christian, you are God's co-worker. God works with us and through us to spread the good news of Jesus. This means that you and your life have purpose and meaning and can last well beyond these few years here on earth. Your work can have eternal significant and infinite value because Christian, you are an ambassador, a priest, a witness, and God's fellow worker. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this very high calling. Father, I pray that out of the joy that you have given us, that it would overflow and that we couldn't help but share mm -hmm. the good news of Jesus. Share how you are alive and at work in us and around us. Father, we pray that you would give us spiritual eyes to see opportunities to bring up spiritual conversations. And then give us the guts to do it. Help us not to be cowards. Help us to be strong, courageous. We pray that we have great conversations. I pray this week, specifically this week, that everyone who is listening to this message, you would give them a divine appointment. Show them an opportunity they have to bring up a spiritual topic and see where it goes. Give them grace. Give them courage. Give them the words. Father, help us remember our lives have a lot of eternal value because we can share a message that is of eternal significance. We thank you for this. We thank you that you give us your spirit to help us. We're not on our own. Continue to call people to yourself, especially people that we know and love, friends and family and neighbors. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Great. We clap for the Lord, we honk for the Lord. I love it. Our final hymn this morning is another one, a classic of the Christian faith, which goes along with this message very well. It's uh, I Love to Tell the Story. It is number 297 in your hymnals, and it's also in your insert.